Hello, and welcome to this session of the 17th Annual Roosevelt Reading Festival, the latest installment of the FDR Presidential Library and Museums at Home with the Roosevelt's virtual programming series. I'm Herman Eberhardt, the Supervisory Museum Curator at the Roosevelt Library, and we're excited to bring the Roosevelt Reading Festival back this year. And we look forward to re reviving our traditional format on site at the Roosevelt Library in 2022. It's my pleasure this evening to introduce our next Reading Festival speaker, Howard Blum. And I invite you to join us for some Q&A in the YouTube chat following his presentation. A former two-time Pulitzer Prize nominated reporter for the New York Times, Howard Blum is a writer for Vanity Fair, an op-ed writer for The Hill, and the author of many New York Times nonfiction bestsellers, including the Edgar Award winner, American Lightning, Terror, Mystery, and the Birth of Hollywood. His many other books include Wanted, The Search for Nazis in America, Dark Invasion, Germany's Secret War and the Hunt for the First Terrorist Cell in America, and The Brigade, an epic story of vengeance, salvation, and World War II. Mr. Blum's 2018 book, In the Enemy's House, The Secret Saga of the FBI Agent and the Codebreakers Who Caught the Russian Spies, was shortlisted for the J. Anthony Lucas Prize jointly awarded by the Columbia Journalism School and Harvard's Neiman Foundation. This evening, Mr. Blum will be talking about his newest book, Night of the Assassins, the untold story of Hitler's plot to kill FDR, Churchill, and Stalin. Many of our viewers are no doubt familiar with the famous 1943 wartime meeting at Tehran between FDR, Winston Churchill, and Joseph Stalin. In Night of the Assassins, Mr. Blum tells the story of a murderous plot that, had it succeeded, would have led to a dramatically different ending to that fabled meeting. And so without further introduction, I wanna welcome Howard Blum to this program, and I'm gonna turn things over to him. Thank you. When I first started working on Night of the Assassins a few years ago, a few years ago, remember back then, before Zoom, before wearing masks, when we could all be in the same room uh, hearing talks. Well, oh, I shouldn't digress, but it's, it's, it is a distant memory. It seems like part of, of another lifetime. But back then when I was first working on the book, I would spend a lot of time reading about World War II, trying to put myself in the shoes of the people I was writing about. I'd be wondering, would I have been able to find the ingenuity, the wisdom, the common sense necessary to protect my family and myself, to help guide us through troubling, unsettled times? I'd be writing away in my office as I am now. On, I'm in a hilltop about an hour and a half south of the southeast, really, of the FDR library. It's a rather bucolic site. There are stone walls, fields, a pond. You might even hear the frogs croaking in the background. Uh, but it's very cut off deliberately from the world. And I would try to put myself in the shoes of people living through a world war. I would try to find the empathy to create characters. I wish to wishing that I could create characters living with a constant sense of danger, a constant sense of not knowing what was going to happen next, a constant sense that something was lurking out there ready to strike and upset their lives. Well, now it's a couple of years later, and all I can say is be careful what you wish for. Now, I'm not saying living through a pandemic is the same thing as living through a war. There's not an enemy trying to conquer us. There's not an enemy trying to steal our treasure, replace our way of life, our moral codes with their own. But we are fighting for our lives. We are live through a time where we're fighting to, for our future. And in a pandemic, as in World War II, we turn to our leaders to help guide us through this time of crisis. We look to them to show us that there's a way out of it, a way to navigate through it. And at the end of the crisis, life will be as we once knew it and perhaps even better. In fact, I would suggest that in many ways, that was what the last presidential election was about, about a search for 
a leader who could help guide us through the next stage of this nation's growth, this post-pandemic world. And so I think you can understand, or readers will be able to understand with a greater sense of uh, resonance, uh, the story I'm going to tell this evening. It's a story about how the three allied leaders doing, during World War II were put in harm's way. It's a story about Hitler's realization that what he couldn't win on the battlefield, he might be able to win by replacing the three allied leaders, by eliminating them. Hitler came up with a secret, daring mission. The mission to assassinate the three allied leaders, FDR, Churchill, and Stalin, while they attended the Tehran Conference in November 1943. The assassins, a select, specially trained group of commandos headed by the man even the Allies called the most dangerous man in Europe. And the stakes? Well, nothing less than the future of the world. And it fell to one man, uh, the head of FDR's Secret Service detail, Mike Riley, to find the guts, the integrity, and the ingenuity to thwart this assassination attempt. It's a story that has its antecedents really in January 1943 on the last day of the Casablanca conference. On that last day of the conference, FDR addresses the assembled press and he says something that takes Churchill by complete surprise. He announces that the war will continue until the unconditional surrender of, the, of Germany. And these two harsh, unforgiving words, unconditional surrender, take the Germans by surprise too. Now, at this point in the war, Germany's leaders, most of them at least, realized that they would never win on the battlefield. After the encirclement of the uh, Nazi Sixth Army at Stalingrad, after the successful invasion of North Africa, after bombers started coming off the assembly lines in America and American troops were being shipped overseas, Germany's military leaders realized the war could not be won in a, in a fight. But they had a very pragmatic end game strategy. They thought they could still steal a stalemate from the jaws of defeat. They thought they could go to the negotiating table, they would sit down with the war-weary allies, and they would be able to cut a deal where the Reich would survive, Germany would be able to maintain uh, most of its wealth and even some of its new uh, acquisitions in the East, and there would be a future for them and for the Reich. However, with these two harsh, unforgiving words, unconditional surrender, they realized that there would be no peace negotiations. They realized that the Reich would not survive, and they realized that they would be hauled before Allied war crime tribunals and have to ask, answer for their crimes against humanity, their crimes against the Jews. And they knew what the verdict would be. They would be marched to the gallows unless something could be done, unless there could be a way to eliminate the three Allied leaders who were issuing this ultimatum. And so in July 1943, a meeting took place, a secret meeting took place at the Eden Hotel on Budapest Strasse in Berlin, in a private room just behind the bar. Now, on most evenings, the Eden Hotel bar area was the site of a different sort of intrigues. Uh, it was where the taxi dancers would gather. These were young boys, barely adolescents, who for a few pfennigs would dance with the lonely German war widows. But the two men who met that night had a different sort of intrigue on their minds. These two men were Germany's chief spy masters. One was General Walter Schellenberg. He was 33 years old, the youngest general in the entire German army, and he was head of section six, the cloak and dagger operations unit of the SS. But Schellenberg was not your typical SS thug. Uh, 
Uh, he was not even really a true believer. He had joined the SS uh, before the war when he was a young lawyer, and he thought this would be a way to ensure his gilded future. But now he realized that future that he once imagined him having was in jeopardy. And so he had come to discuss with the other man there if something could be done. The other man was also a spy master. He was old enough to be Schellenberg's father, half his size. He often walked around with a dachshund uh, in his arms, but he was a true war hero. In World War I, he had won the uh, Medal of Honor. Uh, and he was Admiral Wilhelm Carnassus. He was head of Germany's ABFOR, their traditional military organization. And the two men had gathered for the secret meeting because of something Churchill had recently said in a radio address. Churchill had revealed that the Allied leaders were hoping to meet together, all three of them, for the first time very soon to discuss the final strategy for the war. The time and place of this meeting had not been decided, but and it would be nevertheless even top secret, it would never be revealed, but Churchill had now decided to disclose that a meeting was being discussed. So these two spy masters started thinking, they were driven by the idea, if we can assassinate the three allied leaders, if new leaders can be brought in, perhaps we can even save our own necks. But as once as they brought up the topic, uh, and tried to figure out an assassination strategy, they realized how daunting it was. For one thing, Germany didn't know where or when this assassinate, this meeting would take place, and they couldn't count on Germany's intelligence forces to find uh, the time and place. And they also knew that the three allied leaders would be very heavily guarded, and that's an understatement. Uh, without knowing where and when this meeting was going to take place, how could they formulate a plan? It seemed they realized like an impossible mission. But then in September, on September 12th exactly, something happened that convinced these two spy masters that maybe an impossible mission was possible. On that day, in the afternoon, on a at a mountaintop in the Italian Alps, 7,000 feet high in the air, from the clouds, 12 gliders swooped down slowly uh, towards the top of this mountain. The gliders had swastikas on their fuselage, and it was a rescue mission, a mission to rescue the imprisoned, deposed Italian dictator, Benito Mussolini. The man heading this rescue mission was a SS commando by the name of Otto Scorzini. Scorzini was, when you think of him, you can think of your, your typical Aryan Superman. He was six foot four, broad shoulders, had a dueling scar etched on his cheek, and he was very much so a true believer, a true Hitlerite. He was a supremely confident and very ruthless commando. And he was given the assignment by Hitler himself at a meeting at Hitler's hideout in the Bavarian woods to rescue Benito Mussolini. So Scorzini threw himself into seeing if he could come up with a plan. And here was Mussolini on this mountaintop prison, 7,000 feet up. There was only one way up the mountain, a single cable car, and the base of the mountain was surrounded by a, a group of crack German troops. They couldn't get through them to get up on the cable car. You couldn't land a troop carrying plane on the mountaintop because there was only a small rocky area. You couldn't paratroop uh, commandos down on the mountaintop uh, because the winds were too strong at 7,000 feet. They would blow them all about the Italian Alps. So Scorzini decided to risk taking the gliders out of the sky and have them try to land on this small rocky mountain field. Well, 12 gliders came in that afternoon and five immediately were blown off the mountaintop. They crashed into adjoining mountains and everyone on board was killed. The other seven, most of them just crash landed on this rocky terrain, uh, but Scorzini survived. He was pulled out of the wreckage of his gliders. 
He rallied his men. They stormed the prison where Mussolini was held and they rescued him. And two nights later, at a midnight ceremony, an elated Hitler was uh, greeting Mussolini, hugging him. He gave, uh, he gave Scorzini the Iron Cross. Uh, it, it was a, a joyous day for Germany, which hadn't had very many joyous days recently. And even the Allies were impressed. The New York Herald Tribune uh, called Scorzini the most dangerous man in Europe. And this was picked up uh, by papers all around the world. And in the aftermath of this rescue, General Schellenberg, the SS spy master, approaches Scorzini. And he says, I have a mission for you. I want you to handpick and then personally train and then lead a group of assassins who will kill the three allied leaders when they meet. Scorzini considers this for just a moment. And he says, no, it's impossible. It can't be done. They'll be too well protected. And he starts to walk away. But the spy master very shrewdly counters. That's why when you succeed, you will become the most famous warrior in German history. And with that bomb to his colossal ego, Scorzini accepts the mission. But even as he accepts the mission, he realizes it probably will never take place. We, we don't know where or when this meeting is going to take place, and we'll never be able to find out. He starts training his men, picking them, but he, he decides it's just an exercise in futility. He is just waiting to find out when this meeting will take place, and he assumes he'll never be able to find this information. Coincidentally, at the same time, FDR is also trying to find out when or if even this meeting is going to take place. He's been trying for several weeks now to get an answer from Stalin to see if an arrangement can be worked out. FDR is first pr uh, proposed that the three of them meet in Alaska, but Stalin doesn't want to go to Alaska. Uh, FDR then says, well, we'll meet at a ship anchored off North Africa, we'll surround it by destroyers, we'll have planes overhead and we'll be safe. But Stalin doesn't want to do that either. So then Churchill gets into the conversation and he very mischievously, mischief, mischievously proposes, well, let's meet in the desert like biblical princes and we'll have three tents set up. And Stalin doesn't even deign to answer uh, this proposal. So now on November 2nd, FDR summons someone into the Oval Office to see if he can get an answer if a meeting is going to take place with Stalin. The person he summons is Mike Riley, the head of his Secret Service detail. Mike is 33 years old, a very affable former college football star. He grew up in a small silver mining town in Montana. And you ask Mike to describe himself and he says, well, I'm an Irish cop with more brawn than brains. And that's just not really self-deprecating humor. Uh, Mike has a very bad case of imposter syndrome. Uh, he was appointed to the job just two days after Pearl Harbor. He was promoted over more experienced, more veteran agents, simply because FDR likes him. And now Mike finds himself carrying the responsibility of protecting a war crime commander in chief. And there's something as you all know that makes protecting this commander in chief a real daunting task. FDR is paralyzed from the waist down. He can't take a single step. He will literally be a sitting target. And further adding to Mike's sense of responsibility is his relationship with FDR. When Mike was nine years old growing up in Montana, his alcoholic father walked off and he never saw him again. And in FDR, Mike feels he's finally found the father he's always wanted. His relationship with FDR is not just one of professional responsibility, but of deep personal affection. He's determined that nothing happens to him. So now on this morning of November 2nd, FDR tells Mike that he's trying to set up a meeting with Stalin and he wants Mike to go somewhere to 
see if, if he can get an answer uh, if this meeting is going to take place. He might, he wants Mike to meet someone. And FDR is being derip, deliberately cryptic. I mean, he enjoys being the spy master in chief. And that's a story for another talk, uh, FDR playing spy master in chief. But he's sending Mike on this mission to find out if this meeting is taking place. And all he basically tells Mike is, you better get to uh, Morocco, the Mansara airport. A car is going to pull up and someone will be there uh, waiting to see you. So six days later, Mike is in Morocco at the Mansara airport. He's standing under a palm tree. He's looking across towards the tarmac where he sees a civilian sedan uh, drive up and stop just where it was designated that it will stop. There are two officers, officers inside in uniform. They get out and leave. And Mike is supposed to go to the back door, which will be left open for him, and see who's in the back seat. So Mike starts his way, and his first instinct is, is to run, but then he checks himself. He doesn't want to attract attention in case there are any German spies in the area. He has an incipient sense of what kind of trade craft is needed for this kind of mission. So he goes to the uh, car, opens the, the back door. It's not locked. He sits down and he realizes he's staring into the eyes of the U.S. Secretary of State, Cordell Hull. And Cordell Hull reveals to Mike that he just returned from Moscow, where he was meeting with Stalin, and he's agreed to get Stalin to come meet with FDR and Churchill. They will meet the last week of November in the Iranian capital city of Tehran. So now Mike has to hightail it to Tehran and begin a security check. But before he can begin a security check and hightail it to Tehran, he has to do one thing. He has to look at a map. He has no idea where Tehran is in the entire world. He is not even quite sure what, where the country is of Iran. Meanwhile, while Mike has just found out where this meeting is going to take place, as it happens, the Germans have also learned uh, about the existence, about the time and place of the meeting, and they've learned it from a spy, a special sort of spy. This spy is a walk-in, and a walk-in is the most reviled man in the whole community of intelligence agents. Uh, spy masters don't like him because he comes to you unannounced, bearing gifts, but you don't know why he's bringing these, these treasures. Is it because he's a patriot? Does he want money? Does he want to be an actor on the world stage? Or, and this is what keeps them up at night, is it something more nefarious? Is he spreading disinformation? Uh, is he giving you clues that will lead you down blind alleys? But the walk-in who approaches the German ambassador in Ankara, Turkey, comes with a very convincing story. Uh, he says he's the valet for the British ambassador in, in Turkey, and he helps put the ambassador to sleep each night. He gives him a sleeping potion, and then the ambassador on the nightstand leaves out the keys to his private safe. And this walk-in says, that he can take those keys, open the safe, photograph all the documents inside, the top secret diplomatic correspondence, put them back, and then get the photographs to the, to the Germans. And all he wants in return is 20,000 British pounds. So this proposal is relayed to Schellenberg, and 20,000 British pounds in 1943, well, that's a fortune. That's one concern, but he's also worried, is this it? disinformation? Will I be sent, sent down blind alleys? But he has to make a decision. So he decides he'll give the valet the money, but he hedges that bet. He has his Section 6 counterfeiters make up, uh, counter, uh, fabricate the 20,000 British pounds. So he pays them off with counterfeit money. It doesn't cost him anything. And he waits to see the documents he gets. And the documents, he says, are absolutely stunning. That, those are his words from his memoir. And the documents are so persuasive uh, that the spy gets the code name Cicero after the German orator who also 
uh, spoke so eloquently. Well, these documents speak very ele elegantly to Schellenberg's besides. And among these documents eventually are the details of the meeting in the last week of November, 1943 in the Iranian capital city of Tehran between the big three. And Schellenberg believes the operational god, gods have now shined on him. He now knows where and when the meeting will take place. And even better than that, Tehran is in many ways the perfect city for him. Uh, since the start of the war, the Nazis have been running a spy ring in the city. They've had their agents embedded in Tehran, working out of safe houses. And also, during the past three months, they've been sending commandos parachuting into Tehran, and not into Tehran, into northern Iran, to sabotage allied shipments, uh, lend lease material that have been going to Russia. And the man who's been heading these commando missions has been none other than Otto Skorzeny, the man he wants to lead the assassination attempt. So things are looking pretty good for him, uh, Schellenberg believes. And he then sends his agents who are in Tehran to try to find a way into the embassies where the meetings will take place. And his chief spy in Tehran starts poking around and he realizes this is gonna be really difficult. The, aid, the embassies are really well protected. They have high walls, there's soldiers in front of them and inside. How are we gonna do this? And then something occurs to him. He's been watching these embassies for days and days, and he realized he's never seen what is a very common occurrence in Tehran. A water truck usually pulls up to deliver fresh water because cholera is raging through the city. And he wonders why this isn't happening at the embassies. And he learns that the American engineers, when they first came to Tehran, uh, a year and a half ago, when the first thing they did was to dig water tunnels uh, from the ends of the mountain streams into the embassy grounds so that fresh water can be delivered daily. And so now he has a plan that they can put the commandos into the tunnels and they can sneak underneath the embassy walls, underneath the guards and make their way right into uh, the embassy grounds where the big three will be. But now Schellenberg has another problem. He has to decide what day, when would be the best day and the west best time during the conference for the assassins to strike. He wants a time when the, he can be sure the three leaders will be together. And he'd like it to be a social situation when the leaders are relaxed, when their guards will be relaxed too. So he starts doing research in his lawyerly methodical way. And he discovers that the last night or the last day of the conference, November 29th, 1943, will be Churchill's 69th birthday party. And he predicts that that night, there will be a party, a birthday party in the British embassy where all the three leaders will attend uh, to celebrate Churchill's birthday. And at that moment, his plan now has it, his, his assassins will be emerging from the water tunnel. They will be making their way in the moonlit darkness across the embassy grounds, getting closer to, to the dining room doors of the British embassy. And then as the voices inside are raised up and singing, happy birthday, dear Winston, the assassins will crash in to deliver Hitler's birthday present. An impossible mission suddenly looms as quite possible in Schellenberg's eyes. Mike, meanwhile, has arrived in Tehran and it's a city of 1 million people, a city that's also a very Middle Eastern city with twisting alleyways, a grand bazaar, cafes filled with people, uh, smoking hookers, playing with their worry beads. But he also feels it's a city where bad things can happen. There are a large and vocal fifth column uh, of German supporters in the city. And 
he has a bad sense of things. And then he goes to meet with his Russian counterpart because Russia has the largest force in Iran. They also have the largest, they really control the city of Tehran. And he goes to meet with his Russian counterpart. This is General Dmitry Arkadia. He's the head of the NKVD, which is the precursor to the uh, KGB. And Arkadia is distant and Riley too is distant. It's a hostile encounter. It's like the meeting between uh, Putin and Biden that happened yesterday. Uh, they're not the best of friends. But Arkady confides to uh, Mike Riley that they have a spy in Berlin. And this spy has just revealed to them that the Nazis have been requesting weather forecasts for the last week of November in Iran. Now, the Russian general says, but don't worry, it's probably just a coincidence. Uh, maybe the Nazis are planning a sabotage operation up north on one of the allied supply trains. But Mike doesn't believe in coincidences. In his job, he can't afford to. And he immediately calls for a crash meeting of the OSS. That's the US's wartime task force. He wants to meet with the resident agents in Tehran. And he expects to see a room full of veterans, experienced professionals who will be able to help him protect the president. And he goes into the room and he sees what he later describes as two boy spies. They're two young men, about 24 years old. They look like college students, which they are. And he asks them, where is everyone else? And they say rather forlornly, that's it. Where the Tehran station, where all there is. And they further explain uh, that they were graduate students in archaeology before the war. They were recruited, sent to Tehran to work for the OSS. And uh, they might know a lot about ancient Persian kings, but they really have no idea what's going on in the streets of Tehran today. So Mike is reeling. He said, well, don't you have anyone at large in the city embedded? And they say, well, yeah, we do. We have a 25-year-old guy uh, we picked up in the motor pool. He knew German, so we have him working as a piano player in a German cafe where the expatriates hang out. And now Mike doesn't know whether to scream with rage or laugh at the ludicrousness of it all. So he hightails it back to FDR, and he says, boss, Mike always calls the president boss, it's a term of affection and respect. He says, boss, you can't go to Tehran. He's pleading, his voice is plaintive. I won't be able to protect you. It's just not safe. And FDR, calm and resolute, responds, Mike, I have no choice. Tehran's the one city where Stalin will agree to meet. I have to go there. We're going to discuss a strategy for D-Day. I owe it to the troops who are going to be serving on D-Day. I owe it to them to be there. You're just going to have to keep me safe. And so on November 27th, the three allied leaders arrive in Tehran. Churchill is the first to arrive and he comes in, his plane lands at the Russian controlled airport outside the city and he expects to sneak in. The time and location of the meeting is still top secret and he's hope, hope it stays that way. But when he gets there, there's the British ambassador and there's a band and there's a ceremony. And then there's his car, he's putting an open top limousine and he's driving along these streets into the British embassy. And along the entire route, uh, there are Persian cavalry men in comic opera uniforms sort of guiding the way. And later Churchill writes with a sort of warden sarcasm, if this had been planned to put me in the most possible danger, it could not have been more successful. The entire route, he feels the assassins uh, catching him in their crosshairs. He keeps on waiting for the bullet to fire, but he finally makes it to the British embassy. FDR doesn't arrive till later that day, to three that afternoon in his big C-54 plane, and Mike very swiftly gets him uh, to the American embassy, and he's fixing SDR up in his second floor suite, and Mike is feeling uh, quite good about things. Everything has been handled 
pretty well. And he gets a notification that his old friend, the Russian general, Dmitry Arkadiev, is downstairs wanting to see him. So Mike goes down. He thinks Arkadiev will be telling him that Stalin has arrived and that he wants to meet with FDR that evening. But as soon as he approaches Arkadiev, he sees the hangdog look in Arkadiev's eyes, and he realizes something is very wrong. And Arkadiev says that last night, 38 German parachutes came down and landed outside the city. And Mike's heart, he later says, literally stops. But then Arkadiev says, but we caught all 38 of them and we interrogated them quite severely. And Mike can only imagine what it means to be interrogated by the NKVD, but pushes aside his qualms because he figures at least uh, the boss will now be safe. But then Arkadiev says, and we learn as six men came in on a separate plane, they are still on the loose. And so Mike is now feeling a sense of intense desperation. And for the next five days, as the conference plays out behind closed doors, Mike, trying to work together with the Russians, is trying to hunt these six men uh, in a city of one million people. And these are six men who are totally dedicated. They refuse to be stopped. They have a foolproof plan. And how this all plays out, how it builds and builds to the moment of the night of the assassin, assassins, well, I'll leave that for you to read in, in my book. Uh, I think it explains it better than I can now. But I hope I'm also not giving too much away when I t let you know that FDR, Churchill, and Stalin are not killed. They're not assassinated. And Another spoiler alert, the Allies win the war. So let's go to December 17th, 1943, three weeks after the meeting in Tehran. And we're in the Oval Office where FDR is giving his first press conference uh, since returning from Tehran. And he's there in the Oval Office sitting behind his desk. Mike is behind him and the reporters are in a semicircle in front of him. And there's a transcript of this press conference that I read at the FDR library. Uh, and about 20 minutes into this press conference, FDR reveals for the first time, well, we had a bit of a security problem uh, during the conference. And you can almost feel things getting quiet. And then he says, it would have been a pretty good haul if the Nazis could, got, could have gotten all three of us. And then he breaks out into a hearty laugh and the press joins in with him. And what's even more amazing to me is that there are no follow-up questions. FDR starts talking about the China question. The press goes along with him and that's where things stand. And there were some comments about the events in Tehran and memoirs after the war. Uh, there were a couple of books published by Europeans, but basically the entire incident of what happened in Tehran remained top secret, buried away in secret files until several years ago, the Russians released a treasure trove of previously classified documents. And I read translations of these and I was excited and intrigued. It was something I'd never seen before. And I spent the next several years going to archives around the world, trying to connect uh, the various pieces, putting together this story. And what I found at the end was a real life day of the jackal and how I put these building blocks together what are the specific items I found, what memoirs refer to it. That's all in the very lengthy end notes in my book that you can see and read for yourself. But let me circle back to something I said at the beginning. We're now living at a time, I believe, where we can understand with a greater sense of empathy, uh, uh, with a more, chilling, um, even a chilling 
immediacy of what was at stake in those days in Tehran. We all lived through January 6th. We all understand now what it's like to have our leaders, Republicans and Democrats, in danger. We all felt the sense of unease uh, on what happened that day on January 6th. And so I think we can appreciate with a chilling sense of awareness, a chilling sense of danger, what hung in the balance that night if the Allied, if the Nazi commandos had been able to make their way out of the water tunnels, across the grounds of the British embassy, and burst in to Churchill's birthday party with their guns blazing. There is a coda also to this story. I book was first published last year in hardcover. It just came out actually a week ago in paperback. Uh, but when the book first came out last June, I was approached by the two guys who made the Homeland uh, TV series and Sony Pictures to turn my book into a limited series. And I've been working with them for the past year in trying to make this happen. Uh, it's been an exciting experience. Maybe it's an impossible mission. It's, we'll see if it actually winds up getting uh, uh, on the air. Usually it's the role of an author to say, oh, look what they've done to my book, uh, how they've uh, bastardized it. But I, I can't complain. I've been involved in creating the, the script. So maybe I'll, I'll leave it to you. You'll be able to read the book and then look at the TV series. And hopefully you can decide uh, which one does the greater justice to the story that is of what happened in Tehran on the night of the assassins. Thank you. And if there are any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer them. <laughs> thank, thank you very much uh, for that presentation, Howard. And uh, uh, I appreciate the spoiler alert that uh, that Churchill and Roosevelt and Stalin survived uh, the, uh, the night. Um, we do have a couple of questions. We have a little bit of time uh, for questions and answers. Um, I'll start in with one here. Uh, what first sparked your interest in pursuing this story? I first read a news item about a press conference that the Russian intelligence service, the SVR, gave in Moscow, releasing a book written in Russian by a former intelligence agent who had access to their files about the events in Tehran. And then they also subsequently released these files. And I read a translation of the book and of the files. And I said, wow, how could this be happening? I've never heard of this. But I started then looking through memoirs of people involved, people like Mike Riley, of Churchill's bodyguard, of uh, General Schellenberg, of Scorzini. And I was able to put the dots together. And then I went to the archives. And in the archives, I found things that coincided with uh, earlier reports. For example, there was a book written just after the war by the, a French journalist who referred to a woman who had been involved working with both the Nazis and the Allies. Uh, she was sort of a double agent. She seemed to be having affairs with both a Nazi and, and with an, a, an American. Uh, I referred to before the American who was embedded in that cafe. She was involved with him too, and they didn't give her name. But then in the British archives, they had a 27 page interview with her and her name <laughs> is Lily Sanjari. And I was able to take that and, and use that to put the pieces together. <laughs> and as you can imagine, she will have a, a larger role than she has in my book in the limited series. <laughs> Uh, here's a question. Why did the Germans have uh, spies in Tehran before there was ever any plan for the Big Three conference there? Well, the sh short one word answer is oil. Uh, both everyone was, was hoping to get oil, but also the Shah, before the Allies 
invaded Tehran was pro-Hitler. Uh, he even changed the name of the country. Why did he change the name of the country from Persia to Iran? Because Iran means Aryan. He even in, hmm. enacted racial laws that were based on the Nazis' pernicious racial edicts. There was a very strong German community in Iran and a very pro-Nazi uh, fifth column in, in the city. And there were even pro-Nazi political parties in parliament. And so the Germans thought this would be a fertile breeding ground as they, it was going to be their stepping stone to India. Hmm. Uh, another question. Um, what became of Mike Riley after FDR's presidency? Well, Mike Riley was with FDR uh, the day he died in Georgia, uh, Hot Springs. He was on duty then. His last official act for FDR was to take FDR's breakfast to the lab to have it analyzed just to make sure that the president hadn't been poisoned. He was also involved during the war in, in designing FDR's plane, the big uh, C-54 that was made especially uh, for FDR by Boeing, and he'd gone out to the Boeing company, and they hired him, uh, and he worked for them for many years as an executive. Let's see. I have uh, one other question in the queue right now. Uh, let me see here. I think you may have already answered this, but I'll, 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 I'll put it out there anyway. Uh, can you talk about uh, a few of the sources you had to mine to put together such a complicated and very secret story? Well, you know, the sources are out there. For example, in the FDR library, uh, right, right there, uh, they had all the menus of Churchill's birthday dinner uh, there. Uh, and so I could even recreate that scene. Uh, they had Mike Riley's uh, diagrams of the motorcade that would lead them into Tehran. Uh, some of the other information, as I said, was in uh, translations of German archives, the Russian documents, and uh, OSS records in the National Archives and the OSS archives, too. Okay, well, I think we've, we're running out of time, unfortunately, but it is a fascinating story, a fascinating book, and hopefully a fascinating uh, program uh, to be seen on TV in the future. Um, I want to thank uh, Howard Blum for joining us this evening. Again, his book, which is, as he mentioned, now out in paperback, uh, Night of the Assassins, I have a copy right here, uh, The Untold Story of Hitler's Plot to Kill FDR, Churchill, and Stalin. I want to thank also uh, our audience for joining us this evening for this Roosevelt Reading Festival presentation. Uh, have a great evening, everyone. Thank you. Good night.